Thank you, yes. My name is Lisa Brown and I am a social psychology professor here at Austin College. Like many black people, I was dumbfounded when after the election of Barack Obama to become president of the United States, that some people now said that we had been ushered into a post-racial era. My cousin and I talked a lot about this. He said he had several white friends ask him whether he thought we were now in a post-racial era. His response to them was that he would know that we were in a post-racial era when black folks could have a Dan Quayle. For those of you unfamiliar with Dan Quayle, he was the <laughs> vice president under George H.W. Bush. And regardless of whatever the realities of his intelligence are, he made certain gaffes during that time that led people to question his intelligence. And so my cousin's point was that the election of an exceptional black man was not evidence of being in a post-racial era, but rather the election of a black man who had been given the same benefit of the doubt as certain white candidates had been, would be. And so that begs the question, how is Barack Obama exceptional? Barack Obama is not the typical person or the typical black person. Barack Obama is one of only four US presidents to have two Ivy League degrees. And so he has more education and a better education than most people in the US, including most US presidents. In addition, on his resume is that he was the president of the Harvard Law Review and then later was a professor at the uh, University of Chicago where he taught certain classes, a very elite and prestigious institution. And so regardless of whether or not people agree with his politics, I think most of us can agree that he has a very impressive resume. Then in terms of Barack Obama being black, he is not your typical black person. In no way, shape, or form am I trying to say that Barack Obama is not black. He's just not your typical black person. Barack Obama is a child of a white American mother and a black Kenyan father who met in graduate school. He then was raised by his white American grandparents in Kansas. Add to that that he's relatively light-skinned for a black person. And there's more and more research revealing that darker-skinned black folk and also darker-skinned Latinos receive more discrimination and prejudice than their light-skinned peers. In addition, there's research in social psychology by Cheryl Kaiser and colleagues finding that black folks and also Latinos who have a stronger ethnic identity or who actually are perceived to have a stronger ethnic identity receive more discrimination and prejudice than their peers who are perceived to have a weaker ethnic identity. And I speculate that it is exactly this perception of not seeming, quote, too black, end quote, is why a Barack Obama became president before, let's say, a Jesse Jackson or an Al Sharpton. Despite arguably being held to a higher standard than his white peers, Barack Obama was still given more of the benefit of the doubt than black candidates who are perceived to be more prototypically black in looks, background, and attitudes. So during our discussion today, we will think about who in US society gets the benefit of the doubt and who does not and who should not. That is, despite some failing or flaw or something else, that they get a free pass when some people do not as perhaps these ideas around who gets the benefit of the doubt and who does not will at least shed a little light onto some of the racial conflicts that have happened in the US in recent years. The number of unarmed black people who have died at the hands of police or some other authority has been alarming. What are factors that may lead to these events and also factors that may lead people of different groups to have very different responses to these events? Well, one potential factor is that a long-standing component of the stereotype of black people is that black people are hostile, criminal, and aggressive. And then research is, that has looked at unconscious types of stereotypes by people like Greenwald and Banaji through Project Implicit has found that if you bring thousands of people through their procedure, including some black people, that there's a stronger association between white people and positive words and then black people in negative words at this unconscious level. 
research then that has tried to look at some of the consequences of this thinking has focused on what's called the shooter bias. And so researchers like Keith Payne, Josh Carell, and Ashby Plant have brought people into their lab to go through a simulation, a simulation in which people pretend to be a law enforcement agent who is trying to distinguish between violent criminals and innocent bystanders. And in the simulation, typically what happens is that people are quicker to shoot a black person who is holding an innocuous object like a comb relative to a white person, but they are slower to shoot a white person in the simulation who actually is holding a gun relative to a black person. And then in terms of actual crime statistics, there's some research that shows that racial differences in drug use do not account for the racial differences in drug arrests. That is, black folks are arrested at a higher rate for drug crimes, even though the racial differences in drug uses are not that pronounced. And so at this time, you know, some people may be saying, well, but you know, some of those people actually were breaking the law. Like if you have illegal drugs, you're breaking the law. Or some of those people who ended up shot, it is terrible, but they were breaking the law. And that is true. Eric Garner was selling cigarettes illegally. Alton Sterling was selling CDs illegally. Walter Scott did have a broken taillight and was fleeing the scene. All true. But we probably all know someone who has broken the law. We perhaps were people who broke the law. <laughs> <laughs> and specifically, what I'm talking about is college students and underage drinking. When college students are caught drinking on campus, rarely is that handled through the criminal justice system. Typically, that's handled in-house through the college judicial system. If that same young person was a townie, that townie would be arrested by the local police, that case handled by the local criminal justice system, and that townie for the exact same behavior would now have a criminal record. In this case, college students get the benefit of the doubt, and townies do not. Most people in the US, we see ourselves as middle class, and then sending our children to college is seen as a very middle class endeavor. So college students are seen as our kids. In contrast, townies are often negatively stereotyped as ignorant, uneducated, and working class. And most people are not aspiring their children to become townies. And so this is a case in which college students get the benefit of the doubt because they belong to a socially valued or privileged group. So that begs the question, which groups are socially valued and privileged? Susan Fisk and Peter Glick, along with TED Talk veteran Amy Cuddy, develop what's called the stereotype content model. According to this model, views of groups fall into two main characteristics. One is warmth, and the other is competence. And so views that, excuse me, groups that are stereotyped as being low in warmth and low in competence include black folks, and particularly poor black folks, but also poor people and working class people of any ethnicity. So that includes townies. Then with the group that is stereotyped as being high in competence but low in warmth, there are groups like Jewish Americans and Asian Americans who are stereotyped as being highly skilled but a threat. And then with the group that is stereotyped as being high in warmth but low in competence, there are several groups that fall into this quadrant. This includes housewives, it includes older people, it includes arguably cancer patients such as myself because cancer patients are seen as disabled and research has shown that disabled people are stereotyped as being high in warmth and low in competence. That is, they're nice people, but mm, I wouldn't want to hire one. And so then, people who belong to any of the groups in these three quadrants then are disadvantaged because they are stereotyped as either cold and thus disliked, incompetent and thus disrespected, or both. In contrast, middle class people, and particularly middle class white people, and college students by extension, are stereotyped as high in warmth and high in competence. 
unless they are given the benefit of the doubt because they are stereotyped in a way that is socially valued. So at this point, some people may say, well, you know, yes, I recognize those stereotypes in our society, but I really try not to be a person who endorses those stereotypes. I try not to act upon those stereotypes. And that may be true. But I'm sure we've all been in a situation when we're interacting with someone who's different from ourselves because we don't know what to expect from them. We're not sure what they expect from us. We're not sure how this, this, the interaction will go. And it raises some anxiety and we may actually pull back from engaging with them fully. With these types of intergroup interactions, how can we improve them in our individual lives? I am reminded of words of wisdom that I got from a fortune cookie that, <laughs> <laughs> that I got in college. It said, you have great ability, try to match it with desire. Cultural psychology research has shown that most people in the US believe that individuals, including ourselves, fail because we lack ability. But is it that we lack ability or is it we lack the desire? That is, do we lack the ability to improve intergroup relations or do we lack the desire? And I believe that most of us want better intergroup relations. The question is, how much? Intergroup relations can be seen as a social dilemma. That is like the tragedy of the commons in which individual short-term interests are pitted against long-term collective interests. There may be times when we are interacting with someone who is a different religion or a different race or a different sexual orientation or who has a disability, and we refrain from fully engaging with them because we're afraid of insulting them or we're afraid of upsetting them or we are afraid of putting our foot in our mouths and becoming embarrassed. These are all examples of what social psychologists call intergroup anxiety. There may be other cases when someone we know says something that's offensive or bigoted, but we refrain from confronting them because we, we don't want to rock the boat. In both cases, does the short-term interest of being accepted outweigh the long-term goal of improving intergroup relations. In situations like this, we often have competing motivations. We want to look good and we want to improve intergroup relations. But given the short-term nature of looking good and the long-term nature of improving intergroup relations, do we often fall back into the convenient goal of being accepted? We tell ourselves that we don't want to upset anyone. We tell ourselves that we don't want to offend anyone. We tell ourselves that we don't want to rock the boat. But I would argue that these are just socially acceptable excuses for justifying our cowardice. Here is a case when we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt precisely when we should not. If we really wanted to improve intergroup relations more than we wanted to maintain a positive self-image to others and even to ourselves, then we would be willing to brave the divide between ourselves and people different from ourselves. As an example, when I was in graduate school, it was the first time I ever did jury duty. And we had been meeting for roughly a week, if you take into account jury selection, the testimony, deliberation, and then the verdict. And one of the jurors was a woman whose arm was not the typical length as it ended at the elbow. I just remember going home and thinking, certainly I am not the only person who is wondering about her arm, but none of us are asking about her arm. I cannot be the only person wondering about her arm. <laughs> okay. But, okay. I'm going to be the one who asks about her arm. Okay, how am I going to ask it? Okay, it would be completely terrible to say, oh, how did you become crippled? But, okay, <laughs> if I say, how did you become disabled? What if she doesn't see herself as disabled? Okay, what is the most neutral and factual way to ask this? Neutral and factual, neutral and factual. Okay, how did you lose your arm? Okay, how did you lose your arm? But what if she lost it through some traumatic accident and asking her just re-traumatizes her? Okay. <laughs> If she says anything about her arm, I'm going to assume that she is comfortable talking about it, and then I know I can ask my question. So the next day, I go to jury duty. We are in the jury room, and she made some joke about her arm. And I just remember thinking, Lisa Brown, now is your chance. Ask the question. <laughs> ask, the, yeah, ask the question. Ask the question. And so I asked the question, and the room went silent. And then 
she answered my question without offense. The rest of us learned something, and all of us could move on. Braving the divide often requires that we take a personal risk. Bravery is not the absence of fear. It is doing what is required despite fear. And research by Crispin Turner has found that just imagining these intergroup interactions, and particularly imagining that they are going well or going positively, is enough to alleviate some of our intergroup anxiety. And assuming that we are people who are not known for being offensive or insensitive or rude, we already have the ability to ask sensitive questions in a respectful way. We just need to match that ability with desire. <coughs> we need to stop giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt that we are well-meaning and push through our fear. We have the ability. We must match it with desire. We have the ability, and we must foster the desire to brave the divide. Thank you. <laughs>